Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of Huddle3 Group. And today, uh, joining me from Athens, Greece, we have Aga Baya, uh, the founder and CEO of Culture Brand and uh, podcast host of Culture Lab. So welcome to the show, Aga. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it was good catching up just before we uh, started rolling, hearing a little bit more about our shared love of the Greek islands. I've, I've certainly enjoyed some time down there. Um, and we've both spent a lot of time sort of being expatriates working mm. in industry over the years. Yeah. Um, we have lots of things in common. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's going to be an exciting conversation. So perhaps uh, for those listening into the conversation, you could provide a little bit of a, a backstory. What brought you to be uh, doing all of this great work around culture? So I think a couple of things, really. The first one is I grew up um, behind the Iron Curtain in communist Poland. And for your listeners who are not very familiar with what it was like, it was a little bit like North Korea, really. So lots of mm -hmm. violations of human rights, extremely isolated environment and a lot of repression. And so one could think that people would be afraid to express themselves freely or that they would really comply to the regime. But if you walked into a home of a Polish family back then, what you would see or hear were conversations that normally you know, people wouldn't have outside. But people thought independently, they read Western literature, watched mm -hmm. Western movies. And I guess since I was a kid, I realized that you cannot really force people to think, feel, and do things the way you want to, even if you have a lot of power. And I suppose I didn't have that language back then. And perhaps as a kid, you know, I didn't really get to the bottom of this. But I, I did realize that someone can have a lot of formal power and yet zero impact on what is actually happening. And that was fascinating to me. And the second thing was a little bit later, uh, my friend and I, we started a company and it was an ice cream factory um, which still exists, by the way. It's one of the, very cool. Yeah, it's one of the largest actually um, ice cream producers in uh, Eastern Europe, cent Central Eastern Europe. Uh, but back then, when we started it, um, Dane, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, I was a student of literature myself. He was the entrepreneurial person and kind of talked me into it. And I always thought of myself as someone who really cares about people and someone who um, gives a lot of attention to creating an environment where people feel good and you know where they can perform. I used to be a teacher before that. And yet in the business environment, it was really hard to cultivate that environment where the people we had in our company would feel engaged, engaged, would feel um, um, like they can really uh, fulfill their potential. And I was acutely aware of it and really annoyed that I was unable to do what needed to be done. And when I am in a situation like this, I think still to this day, um, I never give up. So like, okay, I'm going to figure it out. And that was the beginning of my journey, really. I went down this rabbit hole and I started learning. I remember one of the first books that I read was Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. And it was like, you know, my mind was blown, literally. I was like, yes, yes, that is super important for leaders in companies, of course. And, and so that was the fascination. And the funny thing is, fast forward 10 years, I ended up working in Hay Group. And Daniel mm -hmm. Goldman was one of the directors of that company. Uh, so it was wow. pretty, yeah, so it was pretty amazing, I have to say. Um, and so um, that was a journey, basically. I just needed to figure it out. You know, it was something that really fascinated me. And um, with time, um, that obsession turned into a career. That's awesome. Yeah. It's interesting that it started out in an ice cream factory. I, I would know. never have picked that. <laughs> Funnily enough, my, one of my dad's first jobs was working in, I think, the Paul's Ice Cream Factory in Brisbane. Really? And, uh, Are yeah, you a big and fan of ice these... cream yourself? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, mm. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't balance. I'm either all in or all out, but gelato, if I go to oh Italy God, and yes. I spend some time there, I'm in for that. Yeah. I, I, uh, used to live in Italy. We just actually returned to Greece 
a year ago. We spent uh -huh. um, 12, 13, I think, years in Italy. And it was such a wonderful experience. I could literally live off gelato, nice espresso, good wine. I had everything I needed there. That's so the wonderful. good life. The good life, yeah. That's awesome. So the, the interesting thing about an ice cream factory is that it, it's not really knowledge work, not for most of the people. Mm -hmm. It's people doing tasks, doing manual labor. And, and I often think when we talk to customers and other thought leaders out there that that is a frustrating environment to be able to really own and cultivate culture because it's so task focused and people are working often in um, mm. hazardous, say, safety sensitive roles. Yeah. Um, so, so was that a big driver of that initial frustration was just the heavy task-based workload? Yes. And also there was such a huge urgency actually to cultivate a good culture mm -hmm. because when you think about what the consequences were of, for example, not having safety culture in a company like yep. that, and we did have one really terrible accident, which was a big eye opener for us because we thought that we've done everything we could yeah. to protect people. And so it wasn't the matter of, you know, not having the right tools or not having the right knowledge. It was just the matter of those unwritten norms. And so one of the ladies yeah. who worked in the factory did not wear her net on her hair and her hair mm -hmm. got caught in the machine. Um, yeah. So that was one of those moments when I was like, what is going on here? And, you know, why don't people do what they are supposed to be doing? And yeah. of course, then I understood that it's all about relationships and what is the person who's working next to you doing, right? And what are those unwritten norms? It really doesn't matter what you tell people as a boss, because the moment you leave factory, they're going to do what they are used to doing. And so with time, and I've been consulting my friend a little bit around that, um, they, they did start working uh, with um, their shift leaders and the people who are there mm -hmm. always and making sure that they are role models. But obviously, back to your question, um, yes, there is a lot of frustration, of course, because it is a very constraining environment. And it seems like you don't really have a lot of wiggle room. But of course, if you engage your creativity in that, you realize, actually, there's a lot you can do. Yeah. And, and you're right. I've seen some really creative solutions and you touched on a really key word there too, relationships. Yeah. So I've seen walking some really advanced manufacturing floors, just the way they create relationships and almost a uh, gamification of teams mm -hmm. on the floor doing different parts of the product line. Yeah. Uh, and, and there is some cool stuff going on in those environments. W when you think relationships, uh, I saw a good post the other day that said, first, you need to get your sleep and hygiene right, then your relationships, then your mindset. Mm. It was all about don't start with mindset because if you don't have the relationships, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And if you're not healthy, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about, uh, I've, I've heard on some of your podcasts, this BYOC, bring your own culture and, and the role of the individual sort of in their mm -hmm. two meter radius. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how how you've seen that uh, through your work and over time impact good relationships in, in a business, in a team? First of all, let me just say, I love that you did your homework. I almost didn't remember <laughs> and bring your own culture thing. So thank you for reminding me. But indeed, I do talk about this from time to time. And I need to actually talk about this more because it is a great concept. And it's all about um, exactly, you know, I, I really do believe that, that you are responsible for the culture around you. I don't know what the radius is exactly. Maybe it's one meter or two meters, whatever it is, right? Yeah. But, but we absolutely are. And the things that we do are what shapes culture around us. And so I deeply believe in the fact that actions clearly speak louder than words. I'm learning this every single day over and over again with my team as well. And... Back to your point, if relationships are more important or should come first and then your mindset or vice versa, to me, it feels a little bit like a chicken and egg uh, question, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not entirely sure because I think if you don't have the right mindset, sometimes it's really hard to build really great relationships. Um, if you don't have those relationships that give you the foundation 
or relationships that can inspire you to live up to, you know, your best self. Again, it's hard to build uh, a mindset. So I wouldn't necessarily say that one comes before the other. I would say they're definitely both important. Mm -hmm. And I think we should be focusing on both. Um, and, you know, back to mindset and back to that responsibility for, for our own actions, because your question was, have you seen examples of that playing out in organizations and how exactly that plays out? Um, yes, I have seen examples, um, really powerful ones, actually. And um, one of them, which I think had a profound impact on me, was because I was a member of a team where we had um, a colleague who um, had a mindset that was contagious, incredibly solution focused, incredibly positive, but not positive in the way, you know, oh, it's going to be fine, don't worry. But she was the person who would take any obstacle and say, okay, how can we turn this into the way forward? Like the obstacle is the path. That was her philosophy. Right. And, right. And tiny little things as well, right? So it wasn't just those huge issues that we were faced with, but you know, I can't find the right connection flight. She would sit with you and say, okay, so maybe you can be, you know, you can do this, you can do that. And it really rubs off on you. And I remember that after three years working with her, I was a completely different person. Yeah. Completely different person. Um, and thankfully, um, that's really stayed with me. Um, and unfortunately, she, we lost this colleague. Um, mm. She died way too early. And I know that her legacy and that impact that she had, not just on me, but really on everyone around, it still lives um, in us. So it's incredibly powerful. Um, and it kind of makes me feel, you know, how huge a responsibility we have, um, not just as leaders, but colleagues, because those little yeah. things really matter, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, and, and it is interesting. I like the use of the word contagious um, sort of energy of, of, mm. of your colleague there. Like she, she brings something that does rub off on people through action every day, um, mm -hmm. not just through the values that are on the wall. Um, and, and often, and we've seen this theme emerge in a few conversations we've had on this podcast, it's those moments of stress and strain and sweat when you're trying to work through a problem when actually team members, not just leaders, team members can, can help diffuse the situation, mm -hmm. create positive framework to come out the other side in a, in a better place maybe than you went into. Yeah. And Dane, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but we um, work sometimes with organizational network analysis and to identify the so-called informal influencers, right? Because yeah. these people very often are not visible to their companies, to their team leaders. Um, and it's interesting because they typically have two things that other people don't have. Uh -huh. One is they have social capital. So relationships, back to your point, right? Yeah. Um, they're really well connected. So their network, and if you map it, you can see that their network really is quite expansive. Um, and the second thing that they have is they have credibility and trust. And right. so... It, and this is super important as well, because it's not just about being social butterfly, but it's about building quality relationships with people. And um, when you have that, then absolutely whatever you do, it is going to rub off on others and it is going to create that viral um, impact um, that basically I think 10 X's any behavioral change in terms of speed, but also scale and reach that yeah. you might want to... Um, cultivate in your company. So it's really interesting to identify, you know, who, who are these people on my team, right? Yeah. And how could we engage them in creating that positive contagion where the right behaviors, the behaviors that help us be inclusive, uh, that help us be um, effective, innovative, whatever your objective is, yeah. who are those people who can help us um, create that contagion across the company? Yeah, and if you can create contagion that has a 10x impact, that's uh, good for everyone. The, mm. the, the network analysis, I've read a lot about it. I've never done it in an organization I've been working with or a part of. But it does fascinate me f for the reason that you mentioned, that you get these people with social capital and reach and credibility and trust. And, and they can actually create, I think, faster learning loops, learning cycles, um, and better communication 
pathways mm-hmm. to get messages out to businesses so they don't feel like something's coming down from the heavens. Yeah. Um, yeah. H- how do you go about starting that process if you're a small to medium business and you can't mm-hmm. go and pay a big consultancy to come in and do the yeah. analysis? Are there, yeah. are there some ways that you and the team come in and work with business owners to, to look at um, their business and the network within their business? Yeah. So first of all, you can really um, DIY it. Um, so uh-huh. you don't need to hire anyone. And I think this is what's so encouraging. No, you cannot map the networks in the way that organizational network analysis does it because it is a complex um, tool and and clearly internally in-house, you are not going to have that capability. But if you are a company of 200 people or, or less, then I think that uh, by asking the right questions and truly listening, uh, you can identify who these people are. And the questions are really, you know, who, uh, who is the person that you go to when you need reliable information? Yeah. Who is the person that um, sort of elevates um, the mood and uh, morale in this team? Who's the person who, um, when you need help, um, they, you know that they're always going to be available? Right. Yeah. Or who, who's the person who's accessible? Like when, when you are in a pinch, um, there are some people that are easier to, to reach than others. Who is this person? And basically the questions are always about who is this person? Because uh-huh. you want these people to be peer nominated. Yes. So it's not like, you know, describe the attributes of a person like that. You're really interested in, in individuals. And then I would advise uh, people in companies to approach them and say, you know, a lot of people told me that you are a person that they turn to for advice, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so, and we want to work with a group of people who will help us to strengthen our culture or transform it or evolve it, whatever it is, and um, approach them and engage them and give them also the opportunity to decline the invitation. I think yes. that's very important, right? Yeah. <laughs> because you don't want to force anyone into that. You you want them to want to do it. Um, but I think in itself, it's already a wonderful recognition when you can say, we know that your colleagues value you and you are very important to this organization. So we would like to engage you in making things even better for, for your colleagues here. I like that approach. It's funny, my son had an experience at school last week. His teacher said, his name's Riker, Dutch name. Riker mm-hmm. Gruneveld, can you please stay after class? And everyone was like, oh, you're in trouble. And <laughs> his, his teacher comes and hands him a piece of paper. And I thought they did this brilliantly. And the piece of paper, it's got like a, a, a Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory kind of Whoa. vibe to it. It's like, here's the golden ticket. And it, uh-huh. and, and it says, we've, we've identified you as someone who's, really positive and supports your classmates. Mm-hmm. And we'd like you to um, apply for this student council if you want okay. to. And I if you it. want to, you can go and have a conversation with these people in this room, but you don't need to be nominated by peers because you got the golden ticket. I thought it was, it, it was he was so proud when he came home, but I was like, wow, I, I wonder if you could do that at work. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it was a buzz. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm going to steal this idea now yeah. with the golden ticket. I love it. How brilliant. So, cl- and so clever. So clever. So clever. And I love the approach of you can apply. So like you are not forced to do that, but if you would like to, you can apply. Absolutely. And then you yeah. pick the people who can apply. I'm going to steal it. I love it. Golden ticket. Thank you. <laughs> and, and so once those people do opt in with some of the teams you've worked with, where do you see the right format for helping them you know, be part of a group that's that's trying to affect change or build a communications plan? Is it more of a, a tiger team um, or are they being moved in their role? Like how does that tend to play out? So, so it's definitely not a full-time job. It's definitely something that um, shouldn't take too much of people's bandwidth because actually what they're going to be doing is they're just going to be doing their job um, just like they did. It's just that uh, they will do it perhaps slightly differently. So it's about the how, not about the what, typically. Right. Um, Unless, of course, you have a slightly different initiative. But when we are talking about creating the sort of viral behavioral change, um, typically what happens is the organization already knows that there is a shift that needs to happen. 
Right. So for example, you know, you have identified through some sort of diagnosis that yes, you want to be um, a very innovative organization, but you discovered that um, there's no psychological safety in yeah. your teams. And yeah. so people are really afraid to think in unconventional ways or challenge status, the status quo, et cetera, et cetera. So you know what's wrong and now you need to figure out, okay, so like, how do we fix it? Mm -hmm. And so the thing to do here is to really identify what are the behaviors that can create that um, psychological safety for everyone um, in really, really granular terms. So it can be even, you know, I will ask a question. If I see someone in a meeting who's very quiet mm -hmm. and hasn't contributed, I will say, hey, um, Tony, you, um, I, I think that, that, that you might want to share something about the project that you were involved in, because I know that there was something really relevant to the conversation that we have right now. Would you mind? So really yeah. drawing people in. If you don't want to put someone on the spot, it depends on the culture. You can design different behaviors, different questions. But the whole idea is that you give people something super, super specific mm -hmm. and basically um, help them be more intentional about displaying these behaviors more frequently and in the moments, during moments that matter. I think we yeah. all know that there are certain situations, right, where when you don't have that psychological safety, where someone doesn't create that space for you, it can be not just very disappointing, but really very damaging. Yes. And so it's important that the right people do the right things during those moments so that you don't lock people up and yep. don't, right? So, so this is the kind of work that you do really with, with these individuals. And um, we typically engage them and activate them just once per month, maybe during a meeting where we talk about what happened, what impact it had. Do they have any other ideas of, you know, what they could be doing differently, um, what problems they have faced? So it's really tapping into the collective wisdom of this group as well. Yeah. Um, and, and typically they really, um, you know, hold their hand on the pulse of the organization better than any pulse survey could. So it's yeah. really good to be connected to them as well. So it works in both ways because they're feeding back to the organization what is happening, what are the root causes of certain things, and also uh, being that connector and the sneezer who causes, who sneezes and the causes sneezer. the <laughs> I know that after COVID is not, is not a great way <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> That's right. But it, maybe it, I need to come up with a with a it better creates way a dispersion it. through the <laughs> through yeah. the group. I like yeah. that. Well, we were talking viral, so it's totally in yeah in uh, in step. Oh, that's cool. The, the the collective wisdom, and you talked about pulse surveys. I mean, through COVID, I think a lot of people that I speak to have felt that they've either been in a death by survey or death by committee environment. Mm -hmm. And we're just throwing all of this stuff at people and it's not really turning into a iterative learning cycle for, mm -hmm. for, for positive change. Um, do, you, do you find that those monthly meetings, you know, when you go in and work with a team, are they part of a, a larger structure? You know, some people are using um, a certain system like a planning system or OKRs and things like mm -hmm. that. Or, or is this just more organic and it's let's get together and, and talk about what we're seeing. Yeah. I, you know, I, what I see is typically, and that's because I live in a bubble. So, you know, I have to, I have to be honest. I often, what I see is often what happens after an organization realizes that we want to be more intentional about our culture. And so we want to work with a group of people who are going to focus on that. And so often I actually see, um, this process being a separate process from, for example, performance management or goal setting or conversations around performance. Yeah. Um, not separate in the sense that it's not linked, but that there is a, an intention that is very specific to improving culture. Yeah. Um, but having said that, the things that I don't see, but I know that happen also, 
um, is that uh, team leaders and teams that um, perform really well, they do have these conversations organically. Yeah. Uh, so, right. And I think a, a great manager knows that they need to ask 13 members, not just what stands in the way um, in our processes or tools, but also what should we be doing differently generally, full stop. And that's yeah. basically what culture is. So, or what holds us back and having these really honest conversations about, or, you know, where you can really express those things. And I think this is where the groundwork becomes so important because you cannot have these organic conversations in an environment where you don't have psychological safety. People yeah. will not tell you, yeah. even if they are your team member. No, I agree. I think that psychological safety, it just keeps coming up. It's becoming a bigger and bigger, uh, I don't want to say obstacle. It's, it's a bigger and bigger asset to the teams that have mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. because there aren't that many teams that have got a high score on that, on that yeah. scale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, for, for our listeners, I think that this, this term is misunderstood. So I feel that it might be actually useful to mm -hmm. talk about what psychological safety really is, because it's not creating an environment that is nice and fluffy and safe and, you know, you, um, there is no risk of failure um, and you, you don't need to be afraid of anything. That's not what it's all about. It's really about eliminating interpersonal risk. In other words, and we talked about relationships earlier, it's about being able to express yourself and the truth as you see it without yeah. the fear of sacrificing the relationships that you have with people around you, right? Yeah. Or, or your think, employment, because some people are afraid they're going to lose their job. <laughs> exactly. I mean, people tell me, you know, this is one of the phrases I learned from, from our clients. They said, this is a CLM here, which means career limiting move. Like, yeah. you don't, you, yeah, you don't share the truth with your boss. Exactly. So, so you know, once something like this happens and you know that there is a risk, uh, either someone is not going to um, speak to you anymore or you are going to miss out on the promotion. Of course, it, yep. it is an unsafe environment. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind because especially if you are a leader, um, because I think we don't realize how scary we can be. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I think as leaders, we tell ourselves, you know, I'm a nice person. Um, I care about my people. I'm so open to ideas. I don't understand why don't they come to me, right? Yeah. Why don't they challenge me? But the thing is, you know, and I, and I see it, and I see it in myself as well. You know, my team challenges me on something, and I listen, and I try to be as open as possible, and I'm feeling that something's happening to my face. Yeah. <laughs> and that they can see that I don't like the idea. You know, and that's enough. You got to have because, a good poker face. Yeah. If you, if you cannot control that yeah. sometimes, it, it unfortunately is going to have a negative impact on your team. Why? Because as a leader, unfortunately, everything that you do gets magnified. Yeah, it does. <laughs> They're all looking at you. Yeah. 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 So, 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 you know, I think we need to put the bar a little bit higher for ourselves. Um, if we're in any kind of leadership role, even if it's not formal leadership role, but people look up to us, um, yeah. because, because un unfortunately most of us, we are not as, as, uh, safe to work with as we'd no. like to believe. No, yeah. I agree with that. It's, it's interesting. I like the way you describe psychological safety as not the fluffy friendly place. In fact, good sign of psychological safety is that people are having what most people would think are uncomfortable yeah. conversations that there's tension because that's actually a good for a team. That's good yeah. for a business. 100%. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if marketing's killing it and if, you know, logistics can't get orders out in time, then someone needs to be having that conversation. Otherwise, you know, you're really going to do brand damage. And uh, we've got uh, Craig Weber, who was on one of our earlier podcasts, does great work around conversational capacity. And to your point mm. on the role of the leader, he, he's got this great phrase, which is that, you know, a leader that comes in and doesn't set the right tone and the psychological safety is essentially robbing the team of intelligence because mm. there's all of these data points and insights yes. around the table. Yes. And, and if you can't have a good poker face or sit there without crossing your arms and looking defensive, mm -hmm. then, you know, Craig's always like, well, just get out of the room, tell them, yeah. to to talk about what they think needs to be done and have mm. a 
have an ambassador present on behalf of the group when the boss comes back in. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, when you come back to the room, again, <laughs> practice your poker face <laughs> because Breathe. I've seen this happen. <laughs> yeah. I've seen this happen. I've seen teams being super creative and coming up with amazing solutions. Um, then the leader comes in and someone shares the first idea and then it's like uh -oh. finance <laughs> and yeah. everyone's nervous and it's over. Yeah. Game over. So yeah, it's, it's so incredibly important. Um, and yeah, I mean, what can we say? It's, I think what would be interesting and I wonder what you see as well is what are the practices that people can embrace to develop that skill? Because, yeah. um, it's not inherent to human beings. I don't feel that it is. We are quite hierarchical as mm -hmm. a species. And, and so we need to work almost against our own nature to create yeah. psychological safety. Uh, no, I agree. And I haven't found any winning practices. I've found a lot of hacks, but it's hard. What are, what are they? Please, please share them. Some of the hacks. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the hacks right now is about these, uh, uh, what do they call them? Asynchronous meetings. Mm -hmm. Where essentially you say, here's the information that we want to discuss. Mm -hmm. Here's our object. Everyone come in and in a digital environment, right. edit, uh, create a video or, or mm -hmm. make notes on a document. I find that is good because it gives people time and space to digest and to say mm -hmm. what they want without seeing a body language reaction mm -hmm. or having someone challenge them. I think that's a good hack. But, but you can't walk into a live fire environment where there's a problem on a manufacturing line floor and say, hey, let's all go back to our computers and do an asynchronous exercise for the next 24 hours because yeah. it might be a safety issue. So it's a good hack mm -hmm. for a certain circumstance, but yeah. it's not a universal you know, truth. Yeah. Yeah, but I like that one. I think that it also is very inclusive in that very often I see this so many times. You know, I'm an introvert myself. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for me to think on my feet, especially under pressure. Give me one minute and just let me shut off my camera and my yeah. mic and give me a minute and I'm not exaggerating and I will have 10 ideas. But yeah. if you look at me and wait <laughs> and, and tell me, give me five ideas now, I, I'm completely blocked. So I think we need to keep that in mind as well, that, that yeah. the world um, consists of introverts. They will definitely thrive in an environment like this. So there are so many positives to that. Thanks for sharing that. It's a, it's a great idea. No, you bet. It's fun. So the future of teams, obviously we've been talking about a lot of the, the challenges that we've come through from the early ice cream factory to COVID and to you know, be mm. more intentional about culture. But as you start to think about the future, where do you have, um, I guess, vision or hope for, mm -hmm. you know, the, the way that teams are going to be working differently together, the way mm -hmm. that we might be including technologies or, or, you know, doing something that, that is going to free us up on psychological safety and other mm -hmm. key factors. I will start with the vision and the dream. Yeah. And then I'll move on to more midterm forecasts that I have. Okay. But I Great. would love to speak about the vision and the dream first. And my vision and my dream for the future of work is that work actually becomes synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. And this is something that I talk a lot about because in my research, I've discovered that these are the three uh, pillars of thriving cultures. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about the thriving culture, what I basically mean and in, is an environment where people can do their best work. Um, yeah. So that's my dream. I truly believe that as we are evolving as human species, and this is, of course, a positive scenario because there are negative scenarios as well. Yeah, but yeah. the positive scenario is that we will actually have that opportunity to create that because the work that we don't want to be doing because it's either boring or too, too, too hard for human beings, we can outsource to... Uh, robots and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and machines. So we can really focus on doing things that we truly enjoy doing. And for me, this is what work is supposed to be anyway. Work yeah. should be a source of fulfillment and meaning, and it should also give us a community, a sense of supportive community. So this is the dream. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to a midterm forecast, what I'm seeing and the trends that I'm seeing, I think three things pop up for me from many other things. One is in terms of teamwork, um, I'm seeing more of teaming 
than teams. So people come together for a project or a specific task, and then basically this team gets dismantled and people do something else. So there's way more flexibility than we yeah. used to see before. And I think it's a trend that is accelerating. Um, and that, of course, requires a slightly different skill set um, and definitely a lot of clarity when it comes to why are we here, what are we supposed to do together, which has mm -hmm. always been the foundation for great teamwork anyway. But I think in the future, this is going to be even more important. And so clarity around what's our purpose, what are we trying to accomplish here, what are the desired outcomes, and then bringing people together for a short period of time and allowing them this opportunity to collaborate and then go to something else, move, move yeah. forward to something else. So that's one thing. Second thing, and we're doing this at Culture Brand as well already, um, so it's definitely not far in the future. Some companies are doing more of it, is um, collaborative intelligence. Uh -huh. And so it's combining human and artificial intelligence. Um, and that is a very interesting space. I enjoy, we, you know, we use open AI. I enjoy collaborating with, um, Shaquan Dela, we called her, <laughs> so she has a name. <laughs> she's our colleague and she's helping us a lot. Um, and you know, what I've noticed is that it still requires a lot of human touch to have a good outcome. And I think this is really going to be the future of collaboration between humans and machines. So first we need to train them, um, right? So that yeah. they can learn from us because, yeah. right? And so what we feed into it is going to um, show in the output. So our inputs need to be high quality and mm -hmm. it's not only just the reliable information, but also, um, you know, how biased is it going to be? That's a huge conversation, of course, right? Yes. Um, so that's a, that's a huge responsibility to, um, to, to train it and also then um, make sure that, that you retain it within the boundaries that are still serving humanity. Yes. And so we, we need to collaborate with, with these machines and that's a big trend. And I think that it can be really fun collaboration, but it does require a lot of responsibility from us for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I, like, I really like that one. Um, and then there's, of course, another one that you've, you've already alluded to, which is clearly, um, you know, um, virtual and hybrid work are not going away. We yeah. really know that. I don't even think that it's a forecast. It's just stating the obvious. And so in terms of teamwork, I think we're not there yet. So we need to figure out how to work well and in an inclusive way in this environment, because I see a lot of teams that um, work in the same space and then the rest of the team is distributed. And there yeah. are a lot of inequalities there and it's, yeah. it's an issue. It's a major issue. So we need to figure it out, but I think we will see more and more of that. Um, so this is where the future lies. No, no going back, I'm afraid. I know that no. some, some leaders <laughs> are trying to um, go back to how things uh, used to be, but personally... It's just, like, it's just like fashion and music. Some people will go back to a fashion or a yeah. genre of music that they like because it's, they're comfortable, not, not because yeah. it's the right thing to do next. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in some context it might be nice and charming and maybe the right thing to do, right? But but I think um, for the majority of the world, um, if you want to be successful, if you want to have access to a wider talent pool, uh, if you want to um, attract the right talent that's not going to compromise and, you know, suffer a two-hour or three-hour commute, yeah. you, you have no options, basically. No, you're absolutely right. I was on the phone this morning with a good friend of mine in Kenya, and uh, he's in the midst of taking a job back in Saudi Arabia and moving his family to London for a period of time. And the, the whole, the complexities of, of, of what needs to happen right now to bring the right yeah. teams together on big projects, because this is a big yeah. theme park project in Saudi, and he's an expert in his field. So the only way that they're going to be able to retain him long term is if he goes and you know, gets onboarded, but then he can work remote so that he's back with his family in England yeah. or Kenya or wherever it might be. He's not yeah. going to uproot and move everything. His wife mm -hmm. has a career too. So I mm -hmm. think to your point, accessing and attracting and retaining good talent, yeah. it's it's going to be essential to to keep embracing virtual and hybrid. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and thank you for bringing it up because I think often, you know, companies don't even think of this aspect of people's lives. But mm -hmm. up until now, and I've experienced it personally because my husband works in the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. And so basically we've been moving around a lot. If I didn't have that opportunity to work remotely, um, yeah. and I need to say, you know, a shout out to PwC that was really progressive back then when I was working at PwC. And at some point, actually it was my boss who approached me and we're talking 2000, let me think, it must have been um, 2018, 17, somewhere there. So definitely before the pandemic, he approached me and he said, hey, I know, because my husband was in Italy, I was in Cyprus, and he said, hey, I know that you're going to leave um, if this situation is not um, solved. So why don't you just go to Italy and, you know, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And I still kept working for for them for, for a couple of years. So that's, um, that's really important because you give families an opportunity to be together and have a career, both of them. Um, it's an important conversation when we, when we think about, you know, equality and quality of people's lives, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it really is actually going back to your dream of fun, meaning and belonging. Mm -hmm. um, there was a great, great thought leader, Heather McGowan. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her material, but she did a keynote speech last year at Staffing Industry Analysts. And she talked about the fact that now the belonging part is at the center. It used to be, you know, what your profession yeah. or your job is, yeah. but the belonging part is now at the center and people are gravitating more and more to where they belong in the communities they belong in and then choosing the work and the meaning around that. But, mm -hmm. but it is a shift. And I think for yeah. certain industries, certain types of businesses, certain professions, you're going to need to be more and more, um, flexible and open-minded, you know, particularly in the creative industries, creative industries, yeah. you might have a creative that's all about being out in nature and living, you know, way away yeah. from a big city. And then you may have a creative that loves more industrial art and they're living in, in a Definitely. big city. Yeah. So you, you can't, mm. you can't get a creative team all together in one place very easily. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, couldn't agree more. And you know, the funny thing is with belonging is that we actually, like when you think about how many tribes you have in your life, you mm -hmm. realize that it's not one, two, or three, it's probably dozens, yeah. right? Because it's a tribe of people who love sailing. You, you've mentioned that that you love that. Yeah. So there's a tribe there, right? There's a tribe of people who love hiking. I don't know, the tribe of parents that, yep. it's so many. Book club, so, yeah. Yeah, book club. And I think that if an organization is serious about creating an environment where people want to connect with others, want to come back and want to give their best um, uh, energy and creativity and ideas, this has to be one of the tribes. So it's yeah. not to say that it's not to say that work is going to be the only tribe that people belong to, but it has to feel like these are my people, this is my tribe, yeah. and it's meaningful to me to be connected to them. Yeah, I, w I know we were talking just before this show about Gary Ridge, but he's always um, yeah. been very intentional yeah. about the yeah. tribe at WD40 yeah. and his time there, yeah. and that really stuck and worked. Yeah, um, so true. I said the, Godin talks a lot about tribes as well. Yes. So the, the final question I had for you, goes back to psychological safety and, and you mentioned in your midterm outlook, there's more teaming than teams. So does teaming in and of itself, the nature of the fact that you come together for a project, a task, create more psychological safety because it's not as concrete as the, the team that you might ordinarily belong to? Have, have you seen any evidence of that? I haven't seen evidence. This is a really fascinating question. And I think Amy Edmondson, the mother of psychological safety, and the person who came up with the idea of teaming first as well, mm -hmm. she will definitely be able to answer that. So I think we need to reach out to her and yeah. tell us about the data around it because I haven't done research on that particular topic. Um, but my impression would be that um, it, there are two sides to this coin. So I think there are certain aspects of teaming that can make it feel a little bit safer because mm -hmm. You don't have these relationships that you are afraid to um, to damage because yeah. you disagree, for example, right? So it's like you are freer. It's a little bit like this thing, you know, people will tell me their life stories 
when I travel on planes. Like I, uh-huh. I, I hate when it happens because I usually have some work to do <laughs> and the person turns to me and we chat for a little bit and then suddenly it's like, boom, oh, the, their whole life story. And I think the reason it happens is that they know that they will never see me again. So it feels yeah. safe, you know? Great so point. In that, sense, mm, in that sense, I think absolutely 100%. But on the other hand, though, uh, of course, trust takes some time to build. And when you are coming with a new team, it's not there yet. So it's, inter- it's a very fascinating question. I would really love to see some, some research on that um, because I have no idea how to answer it. But I can see that, yeah. I like, I like the two done. perspectives, though, of the trust and the never having to see them again. Mm. Um, they're good perspectives. Yeah. So we can maybe use those to frame the deeper investigation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's I agree. Neat. Well, it's been a wonderful conversation. I mean, from, uh, Indeed. Thank from, you. from your sort of origin story and the ice cream factory, um, yeah. and that frustration with culture and the need to be intentional. And then obviously a lot of talk around relationships, uh, and psychological safety. And I really love the dream, you know, fun, meaning, belonging. You know, that's what that that's what I want to see for my kids and grandkids. I know a lot of people mm. who look at work as a four letter word. You know, they don't. Yeah. It's not a good thing. It's not a good experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but but people should be able to come to work, and it should be one of the tribes that they're excited about being a part of. So I love I love the way you frame that. And uh, you know, those three big themes for the future: more teaming, collaborative intelligence, and and continuing to embrace and experiment with virtual and hybrid work. I think they were all uh, really important for any of our listeners out there that are trying to strategize on, on how to be more intentional with their teams mm. and cultures. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation as well. Um, it's wonderful. And thank you for the work that you are doing. The world needs it. I agree with you that definitely don't have kids myself, but, but it's really important that we create these workplaces for the future generations because they deserve it. We, yeah. We've already done enough damage. Um, they are going to inherit a planet that is in much worse shape than we found it. Mm-hmm. And so I think at least we can do this one thing, right? People spend so much time at work and we have so, you know, so little time on this planet. So we really yeah. deserve a great experience at work. We do. Well, thank you for the work that you do. And for those of our listeners that want to connect with you either on the podcast or with Culture Brand, what's the best way for them to find you? The best way to find me is to type this into your browser, agabayer.com, which is my name, A-G-A-B-A-J-E-R.com. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn as well. So absolutely reach out and connect with me. I'd love to uh, get to know you. I answer all my messages. I try at least on LinkedIn. So <laughs> it's a good way to to reach out and, and chat. And you might also want to have a look at our community for culture brain leaders, as we call them. Um, they are people who are passionate about cultivating thriving cultures. And um, you can find it on my website, but also at culturebrains.com. Wonderful. Well, again, thanks for joining me today. Thank Great you. conversation, Agra, and look forward to connecting again soon. Same here. Thank you.